Andrew, so welcome to Nova Scribes. Over to you. Thanks, guys. All right, so my name is uh, Andrew Papard. We'll get into that into the next slide. But as the first slide's a dead giveaway, issues with tissues, not your Kleenex brand, but your muscle tissues, skin, ligaments, what have you, things inside of your body. Overcoming top injuries facing visual practitioners. So basically, there's always a risk with every job. Wherever you go, people just may not talk about it. Some are more risky than others. So going into what aches and pains might be ailing you and how to go about, won't go maybe as far as saying correcting it, if I can legally say that, but how to definitely nip things in the bud and have a lot of preventative care. Next slide. And give me one more click. There we go. So this guy. So why in the heck should you listen to me? Uh, one more click, Brian. So as I said, I'm Andrew Pafford. I graduated from Virginia Tech with a Bachelor's of Science in Human Nutrition, Food, and Exercise. I started to dabble in physical therapy, and then after my first year, dropped out, switched gears to personal training, of which realized that was sort of my true calling. Within about two to three years, I was one of the top 20 trainers in all of sport and health in the DMV area. Uh, about a year or two after that, there was some political strife with the company being sold about three times over, so I decided to work for a local gym at which point it was taking off and expanded to a second location and began managing one of those locations myself. A couple of years of success after that, my first child was born and things were going okay. But then after the second one was born, realized daycare would be more money than what I was making. So I decided to step away from that. And then the third child was born and then that kind of sealed the deal. So now I've pretty much transitioned to stay home dad, but I still love to personal train on the side with one client that I still see. Uh, so that being said, I've got a background in a little bit of everything from my clientele that I saw working at Sport and Health between young and old, athletic to therapy, and obviously a strong background in therapy and rehab, which brings us a little bit to today. Next slide. So today we're going to go over the three prevailing causes of what we would call non-acute injury, which is layman's terms for you didn't get hit by a bus or you didn't get shot. So these are things that you can do over time that can be what we would call insidious. You just wake up one morning and you go, I got this kind of nagging, nagging pain in my back. And then another month goes by and you're like, wow, that pain's getting worse. But I haven't done anything different for the past three years. What's going on? So those three causes are, Brian, please, dehydration, static postures, and overuse injuries. Some of them might be flagrantly obvious. Others may have a little bit of a different meaning than you might um, envision. So we're going to dive into each of those first about how they can affect us and some tried and true ways to help prevent those from happening. And then by all means, happy to get into any specific ails that you may have and how these can be contributing to what you might be experiencing right now and how to go after those particular things or how to apply the skills that you will pick up today. Next slide, please. So starting off the bat, we have dehydration. Next click. Like so they're coming in one at a time here. So first and foremost, dehydration, not a big deal. You're low on water, drink more water. But why is water important to our bodies? Way to go, Brian. I love it. <laughs> so water is important to our bodies because of this one important structure that almost no one talks about except within the past maybe decade or so which is called phagia or phagia, or if you're an Austin Powers fan, phagia. So phagia or phagia, as you can see, can exist in sort of this easy to see larger structure. As you can look at the kneeling gentleman here, there's a little area kind of circled on his low back called the thoracolumbar phagia. All of that gray stuff is phagia. It's not just tenderness. And it can exist even on a micro scale. So if you look at the breakout of that muscle fiber, you can see that little silver sheath around one of the muscle bundles. All of that's fascia. So literally all over your body and every muscle that you have, this cobby spider web stuff, like in that little bottom picture, exists. And the reason that's important is this fascia holds everything together, but its other main function is to help lubricate our tissues. We are 80% water. So if we get low on water, things start to break down. The way that the fascia works is that the, the metaphor I was told is if you take a leaf and you hold it to the light and you can see sort of like the veins inside of the leaf, that's what the fascia looks like. But at the tips are little tiny bubbles that they call bound H2O. And when that fascia meets restriction, or I'm sorry, uh, chemical or mechanical friction, that water is released 
to help keep tissues hydrated. So it's not just your blood that's keeping everything hydrated, it's also these structures. Next slide, please, or I guess bullet. So of course, drink water, simple, right? Unfortunately, it's not just about drinking fluid, it's also about electrolytes, which I guess is then the next bullet. So electrolytes are your calcium, potassium, magnesium, and sodium. So four electrolytes, simple names, periodic table. But the reason why they're important is because of, in chemical terms, we call hydrostatic pressure, where the body needs to balance solutes and solvents. So I know it's a lot of chemical talk, but the long story short is if you drink nothing but pure water, you will actually dehydrate yourself through a process called hyponatremia, which is the condition. Literally means hypo, little, nature or nutrient, which is nutrition and emia is blood, two little nutrients in the blood. So what ends up happening is if I just continue to drink, excuse me, nothing but pure water, I will dilute my blood and my body will be unable to keep fluid inside and I'll become dehydrated. Uh, Goody, my laptop's crashing. So I'm gonna try to switch windows here. Uh, come on. So in order to keep those fluids in our body, we need electrolytes, sodium, calcium, potassium, magnesium. So if you don't have a fantastic diet, you could be drinking all the water in the world and actually be dehydrated. So nutrition is a whole nother bag of worms that would need to be addressed, but is a crucial component in staying hydrated to help prevent fragile failure dehydration, right? Next slide, please. I promise I hit the right. next one. Do you mean motion is lotion or the next one? Oh, there we go. I didn't see it pop up. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm on my phone now. My laptop just decided to crap the bed. So that being said, so you're getting, let's assume you're getting enough electrolytes and enough water. The final part to, for hydration or good hydration is transport. When I'm ingesting fluids, it has to be moved around my body. Your muscles are like sponges. You don't have blood vessels going into every single one of the little muscle fibers and motor units that exist. The liquids, as they get out of your capillaries, sort of permeate and diffuse around the tissues. But if you're not moving, you're not getting good circulation. So, it's, so if you're sitting all day and drinking and eating right, there still could be parts of your body that are not getting good circulation. For example, your feet because they're staying under the desk, blood tends to pool down there. And so if you're not up and moving around, you don't get any of that mechanical pressure to help push that fluid back up into your body. So without motion and without moving, you can actually become dehydrated as well, or at least have what we would call local dehydration. That fascia is not getting good circulation, good nutrition. Therefore the muscles aren't, fascia starts to become dehydrated. And now you can develop issues simply from sitting in your chair. Next slide, and this time I'm, I think I'm able to see it. So now I've already started to talk about static postures. Let's go a little bit further, not necessarily in the dehydration sense about what they can do. So before we get too far into static postures, I wanna to go to the far end of the spectrum and talk about something called a contracture. A contracture in the medical world is when something in your body has been left in sort of this awkward position for a very extended period of time. Usually this happens in like car accidents where people shatter like a vertebrae in their neck and they have to wear a brace or something for an extended period of time. Those soft tissues over time can lose their elasticity. That's what allows our muscles to move and stretch and skin as well. So when the cast comes off, you're literally stuck like this. And if someone were to try to force you out of it, it would be painful from where your muscles and your connective tissue which should be stretchy doesn't anymore so it is a whole nother bag of worms to try to undo those contractures now the reason i talk about that is we're on a sliding scale of 100 percent supple leopard on this end to contracture on a day-to-day -day basis you can kind of move along that scale so if i'm really active i'm moving back kind of towards that suppleness because i'm getting lots of motion if i'm sitting in my desk and i'm not moving then I'm kind of slowly working towards that contracture state. So the more time I spend not moving, the more my body starts to get stuck in that place and the more work I have to do to get that undone. So the gentleman that we've got here is a living statue. You may or may not have seen these guys in the city, but imagine having to hold a position 
for eight to 12 hours at a time and never move. If you've ever seen them get off work when they're done holding that position, they have to stretch everything in their body, maybe get some good cracks, what have you, because all of those tissues started to stiffen up after one day. Now imagine that's you sitting behind a desk or if you're having to spend an extended period of time on your feet. So now your muscles are trying to cramp up, having to support your body. So static postures can kind of wreak their own havoc, not just on the dehydration sense, but also where the tissues start to lose their elasticity. Next slide, please, or I guess bullet. And so the other caveat to the contracture or losing muscle elasticity is that it's not just the physiological change that we're doing to the tissue, but it's also the messages that we're sending to them. And this is where we get into a little bit of what we would call human resting muscle tension or HRMT. This is what it actually means to be toned. And if you want, you're welcome to try this in your seat. As you are, I want you to try to 100% relax your body. Make everything just shut off and go jelly. The fact I didn't hear any thuds of people sliding out of their seat means you failed in that endeavor because our body has to have some kind of activation going on to keep ourselves in this posture. If you have to think about every little muscle to keep engaged, to hold, just to sit up straight, you would fail miserably because we can only focus on one task at a time consciously. So we are actually training our bodies as we go along in life to hold these postures. Uh, go ahead and hit the next one. I think there's a bullet that's getting on this point. No, nah, it's not quite, but whatever. So yeah, there we go. So what ends up happening is when we say being toned, people think about, oh, being cut and having good muscle striations. What it actually means when you're toned is that you can't shut your muscle off. This is where we joke about guys in the gym who do a lot of lifting and they walk around like this all the time. They're not actually flexing. They're stuck like this because they've done so much muscle activation. Their body just says, well, if you're going to do this all the time, we might as well just stay on and save yourself the conscious effort. So that now is a neurological conditioning that they've done to their body that Physiologically, there might be nothing wrong with their muscle, but because the brain subconsciously is continuing to send a message, the muscle won't shut off. So that is another consequence of holding a static posture. So motion is lotion. If holding that position is bad, moving around and getting out of that to help say, no, 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 I need you to relax. Don't stay in that position is good, right? As we said on that sliding scale of holding it gets me towards contracture, moving around and changing different positions gets me out of it. The more you are holding and sliding up that scale, the more you need to move and try to undo it with that battle of attrition. Next slide, for realsies this time. So now, similar but different, we're gonna talk about overuse injuries. Give me a bullet. So overuse injuries, this talks going back to the dehydration and fascia. If you, for example, say, and the metaphor I was given about fascia is if you take your hands and you rub them together, and you can do this or not and play along at home if you want to go for the full experiment. But if you do this, what ends up happening is your hands get warm, right? So imagine you're working out and you start squatting and lifting and doing all your fun things. You start to get warm. You're generating heat. Well, that's also not just from the chemical reactions going on in your body, but it's also from the friction that's going on inside as well. That's why your hands are getting warm when you get cold, you do this. That water, that, that bound H2O and that fascia is released to help keep your tissues hydrated. Now, if I kept doing this for another 10 minutes, guesses as to how your hands are gonna feel. You're gonna start to get a little dry and cracked, right? Well, if you did this for an hour, what do you think is gonna happen to your hands? They're gonna get red and angry, might even start to bleed, overuse injuries. So imagine, one end of the spectrum, you're running a marathon. You're doing the same motion over and over for hours on end to even on a micro scale of if I'm having to sit at my desk and constantly click or I'm having to constantly stay activated, right? So now I can get the same overuse injuries on a very local scale. So think about like carpal tunnel syndrome where my tendons are so angry that they're starting to swell to try to protect themselves because of all of that friction that's been going on. And so now I'm developing these very specific issues from very menial things like clicking a mouse or even sitting in my chair for too long. Next 
bullet please, which as I just alluded to, tendonitis and then even bursitis, particularly in the joints. Bursa is just a sac that goes around a lot of the joints in our body to help hold fluid to help with that. That can also get irritated from constant grinding and rubbing as well. Again, talking about um, like carpal tunnel or um, even like shoulder issues like the shoulder bursa. Next. And the term overuse, we think of like activity constantly using something. But as I alluded to earlier with the HRMT, that resting muscle tension, sitting still is use. My muscles are still on, even though they're not actively sliding, they're still on and engaged. And that can put pressure on joints, which can cause an overuse injury. So now my low back, my vertebrae are unhappy with me because they're constantly under pressure from how I'm sitting or maybe like my sits bone. You hear about people getting like hemorrhoids. Technically, that's an overuse injury because you've been sitting for too long. You're stretching out the pelvic floor. Um, so sometimes an overuse injury can be caused by a static movement, not just from running. Hence my dude here who's got some pretty gnarly running form. So he's going to have some bad knees and low back big time. So it's not just being active, like a pitcher constantly throwing over and over and over again and getting an overuse injury in his shoulder and his elbow. It could be something um, as menial as sitting or standing for a long period of time. Next slide. So ironically, one of the big things you can do to fix that is motion. Motion is lotion. Now this sounds a little counterintuitive of well, if using it so much pissed it off, how is using it more going to make it better? This is where, as I mentioned, our runner guy here has probably got an overuse injury in his knee from his bad form. If I'm taking it easy, so doctor says, you're running too much, you're blowing your knees out, you need to take some time off and just sit, let your knee rehab. If I just sit, this now goes back to sort of that stagnating circulation that I talked about earlier. So if I don't move, I'm not getting great blood flow, good perfusion to that knee. And without blood means no nutrients and no nutrients means no healing. So now I need to figure out how can I use that joint or muscle or injured area without loading it and stressing it. So even simple, something simple as sitting in place and kind of doing these knee pumps, I'm not applying pressure on the joint, but because I'm pumping my knee, I'm creating mechanical compression that's causing my muscles to, to squeeze and release, which is pumping blood in and getting a lot of the lymph and deoxygenated blood out, carrying a lot of the um, metabolic waste from my tissues. So motion, nine times out of 10, is the best way to go. Obviously, if you have a broken ankle, don't walk on it. That's some common sense. But if you have these nagging injuries, sometimes just getting motion to the area is enough to kind of kickstart that healing. But... It's not that simple. I'm not just selling you on some lame solution. This is where we start to get in sort of fun stuff. Next slide, please. Oh, this was my tongue twister for myself. What use is using an overused part if its use is all used up? As I've just said, helps get promote circulation to that area. So now we'll do next bullet. So weapons of mass reconstruction. How do we go about reversing the clock and undoing these things that we can't always avoid, especially if they're part of our job description? Next bullet. We have soft tissue work. So these are foam rollers and massage balls, or if you wanna go as low tech, even lacrosse balls. I love the lacrosse ball. But what we're doing here is essentially self-massage and that little acronym SMR, is short in the uh, fitness industry for self myofascial release. The self is explanatory. Myo means muscle. We already said what fascia was, and release is just getting something to shut off. So yeah, you're doing self massage. You're using these tools to release tension and pressure and activation from your muscles and fascia to help promote better circulation and to maybe even just turn the off, hit the off switch. Next bullet. So the biggest barrier to entry to this is time. I, it's not even money. These things are dirt cheap. A foam roller is like 10 bucks. You can get a six pack of lacrosse balls for 10 bucks, 15 bucks, and they last you forever, assuming you don't have children who like to pick at them or dogs who like to trip your lacrosse balls, which I do. So really it's just time. It's forcing yourself to do it and dedication. 
and your knowledge base doesn't, you don't have to have a degree in anatomy to know where to put these things. It's as simple as if it hurts, put it there. Your body will naturally be guided to these spots, and we'll get a little bit more in depth into that in a second, but you can kind of let the pain guide you. Next bullet. And the only time that you don't want to be doing this is two reasons or two, two things to keep in mind is one, don't ever roll in bone. Bones can't release. They're, so don't do it with this charts, I promise. And the other one is if you feel like something is going numb or cold, just get off that spot. It's a nerve or an artery. So if you're there for 30 minutes, not good things might happen. But if you're there for 10 seconds, it's fine. Just get off. So if you're rolling out on your muscle and you go, ah, that feels funny, get off. Done. You're safe. Next bullet. The caveat to this is that there is a little bit of what I would call pain for pleasure, where if you treat this like a Swedish massage, you're not going to do anything. You have to get it to where it's challenging the tissues. So on a pain scale of one to 10, I would say you'd have to get this up to about a four, maybe a five. So you would think of this as more like a deep tissue massage. The good news is, is that you are in control. The secret to using these tools is that you are leveraging your own body weight. So you're not having to dig in and hurt your own thumb to appease your arm. You'll be using these tools and your body weight to apply the pressure so you can lie there and do nothing and let the tool do the work. Next slide. So let's talk about how these tools can assist with the three causes. Next bullet. So of course, as we've discussed, the right answer for hydration is drink more water, the next bullet. The likely answer is though, you probably need some nutrition to help back that up. So that way your tissues are retaining that fluid that you're drinking, next bullet. But as we've also said, if you're drinking and eating right, but you're not moving, you're not getting great circulation. So what the rolling can do, and this is, again, a nice little metaphor and reminder of myself, is your muscles are like a sponge. If you take that sponge and you squeeze it and you get all the blood out and you hold it under a faucet, but you pull it out and then let go, is that sponge nice and soaked? No, because it was so contracted, none of that water could get in. So now imagine that is your muscle. If your muscle is squeezing so tight that even if you're getting good blood perfusion to that area, a lot of those nutrients aren't getting in. So now it becomes this negative feedback loop. My muscles are angry because they're not getting good circulation, but the circulation can't get in because the muscles are tight and angry and it just continues to beget itself. So with the rolling, if I can help get those tissues to release, I can get that blood in there. And now that it's happy and now that fascia is starting to get that bound H2O, now I can keep those tissues nice and lubricated. They don't get stuck. They're not angry. They're not inflamed anymore. And now they can start to release and let go. So we're breaking that negative feedback loop simply by doing some self-massage. Next slide. I'm swapping earbuds. So everyone just wave your arms if you can't hear me anymore. So, okay. So now in terms of static postures, let's talk about the golden position. So what can we do what is like the best position? We're talking about ergonomics. What's the best position that we can be in in order to avoid low back pain, wrist pain, shoulder pain, what have you? And that is trick question or trick answer. It's all of them. All of the positions are the best. There is no such thing as an ideal position. Every position has pros and cons. You will trade one demon for another if you commit to a new position. Now, I'll delve a little bit more into this later about what you should be doing, but keep in mind, no matter what you're doing with your standing desk, seated desk, yoga ball, treadmill desk, whatever setup you've got, there is a con. and You have to be aware of what that negative is and how to mitigate that. Next bullet. So as we've also discussed with the static postures, some of it can also be neurological. So ILS, talking about our gym bros with the invisible lat syndrome, guys with their arms stuck like this. It's not just physiological. It's not just the muscles being angry that are holding you in that place. It's also mental. We've trained our body 
to assume this new posture. So with these tools, go ahead and give me another bullet. I think that's the next one. With these tools, we can actually use this to help untrain ourselves. This is no longer, however, just a, I'm going to roll it until I feel it let go. If it's a true neurological component, I have to now become mentally engaged. So I have to use techniques like contract relax or even just getting a better understanding of awareness in my body. For example, uh, how many people can like, you know, successfully wiggle their pinky toe without wiggling their other toes, right? It's our bodies and yet it's a miraculous how many things or how bad we are at controlling our body in very unique ways, even though some people can and others can't. It's not like a car where there's a pedal and there's a brake and then that's pretty much it. There's lots of nuance to our bodies that we will continue to learn throughout the rest of our lives. So we have to learn how to control our bodies or how to even undo things that we've unknowingly taught it. So if let's say, again, I've got a bicep that's not shutting off. If I apply pressure, it is now easier for my mind to focus on that point and try to get that muscle to disengage. And now I'm tricking that nerve into shutting off. So now I'm undoing some of those resting postures that I've unwittingly trained it. So if you, let's say, have a desk where your shoulders are really high in order to get to the keyboard because your ergonomics setup isn't great, right? So now when I get up from my keyboard, I'm stuck like this because my traps are always on. And now I have killer headaches because my traps are compressing all where they attach to my, to my um, base of my occiput. And now I have all of these headaches because my traps are always on. Well, how do I shut my traps off? Well, you need to fix your ergo setup, but you can also use the tools to apply that pressure, try to squeeze against the roller and then allow the roller in. And now you've tricked your traps into shutting off within that session. And now you go, oh, that's what it feels like to shut my traps off. Now I have just taught myself how to do it on command. So next time I feel myself tense up, I can just stop doing it instead of walking around like I'm, you know, something's about to jump out the bush and scare me. Next slide. So we've mentioned the battle of attrition before. Next bullet. And as we mentioned, things are on a sliding scale, right? You've got contracture, total bad news bears on this end, and we've got being supple on this end. And it's not just on or off. It's somewhere on this scale that we exist. So if I am spending more time in bad postures or doing things that my body dislikes without undoing it, then you're going to slowly be working towards the bad end. This is why we say things are insidious or why well, I've been doing this for three years and I've never had any issues. Why is it suddenly happening now? Because for that first quarter of the scale, it wasn't bad enough for your body to detect or really care, but you just continually to gradually move on further and further and further. And as we get older, our body puts up with less crap. Or it's just the crap has gotten that bad that it's finally saying enough is enough and it's making itself aware. So you have to undo that madness faster than it's piling on. Uh, next bullet, please. So as I mentioned, ergonomics are important. There is no such thing as necessarily a golden position, but it is still worthwhile knowing the pros and cons and how to alleviate some of these issues. So even though this is sort of a old school how to appropriately sit at your desk with everything in the position, you're still going to have low back problems because of all of the pressure being put on the spine there. So I'm not saying do not get a Swiss ball for a chair or don't get a standing desk or don't get a special ergonomic chair. What I'm saying is use them all. Uh, don't just have one thing and treat it like the magic bullet. The magic bullet is all of the things. So you do need to have wrist pads and you know mice that are in the appropriate position, but being able to stand up and change your posture, being able to sit in a ball that takes away that back support so you have more core activation, being able to have a walking treadmill so you get better circulation, but you're not walking for eight hours and creating overuse injuries, right? So thinking about investing in your setup of identifying when I sit at my desk for too long, X piece or Y piece hurts, what can I do to change my setup? What, if necessary, what investment can I make that gives me another option to alleviate that and just acknowledge that may come with a demon, but that demon is solved with the other position. So sit to stand, stand to sit, back and forth, and you've mitigated those issues between those two. And the reason why I say it's economic is because these things are not cheap. 
but you're going to pay for it one way or the other. You can either pay for a nice, you know, $500 desk now, or you can have the thousands of dollars of back surgery later in life and affecting you end game. You will pay for it. So might as well be on your terms. And it's usually cheaper if you do it up front. Next. Now, Brian actually gave me a uh, unique, this one's more of a uh, shout out to him because he kind of gave me a little uh, suggestion or I guess tip or trick that he was looking for solutions to. So this one's for him also in terms of um, uh, ergonomics is he mentioned having just like these magnum markers apparently that you guys use when you're up at the board and kind of putting one in between each of your fingers like Johnny Benchcomb, right? And how that causes like crazy intrinsic hand pain. You would be surprised what solutions you can find if you Google some things. And so my lame solution to Brian was I literally Googled um, marker armbands and they straight up make bandoliers like this gentleman here, where you can either get an armband to store your markers on your arm or on your person. So when you're on the fly, you can just literally attach markers to your body and not have to wreck your hand when you're on the fly. Granted, I am not a visual practitioner, so I don't know if that's actually a viable solution, but you know what? It, hey, it's the best I could come up with in the three minutes I Googled it. So I don't know if that fits the bill. And you might be able to make a whole outfit for it and cosplay, and then people just love you because of the persona that you're, you know, the visual practitioner cowboy. I don't know. But you would be surprised of Googling things, all of the crazy solutions that someone else has probably come up with, right? I'm hoping that's laughing. It's like, well, it's actually a really good idea. Not laughing at me like this guy has no idea what he's talking about. But <laughs> uh, next, please. So sometimes you just can't stop. It's your job. If the doc says, oh, you have varicose veins now because you're standing too long. Just stop standing. Well, my job requires me to stand. I can't not stand, doc. So what are things that you can do to mitigate that? Incorporating like a high stool so you can still be relatively high, but now you're taking pressure off your legs so that you can draw. Compression sleeves for your lower quarter to help prevent varicose veins. If you have, let's say, um, something out of reach, bringing a step stool rather than really reaching up there if you're a, as my geography called it, a vertically challenged person. So instead of wrecking your shoulder from your having to reach too much, Bring an adjustable stool that you can just hop on if you have, if it reaching up overhead for an extended period of time starts to hurt your shoulder, you have to get creative with solutions sometimes. If you just can't stop, there are other ways. Docs don't like to think outside of the box. They're usually, they have their own problems. They're not going to be the ones to get creative. So do some creativity, but of course, you can also foam roll to undo that too. Give me the next one. So now I'm going to kind of give you guys my quintessential call to action. I'm no wordsmith, so come up with your own fancy slogan here. Give me the next one. So this is the tip of the iceberg in what I dabble with, which is fitness. Fitness is, unfortunately, gets more of an aesthetic media calling rather than what it should be, which is health and wellness. Give me the next one. So when you have these issues, this is an indicator of your level of fitness. Give me one more bullet. Now, fitness sort of has, it means different things to different people. Like, what does it mean to be fit? If I can deadlift 650 pounds, like, yeah, I'm pretty strong. Or I can run a marathon, like, all right, he's pretty fit. But if that marathoner is so weak, as in lack of strength, that they're afraid to pick up their nephew because they're going to throw their back out. Is that really being fit? Or if that deadlifter who can pull 650 gets winded and thinks they're going to have a heart attack just running across the street to get to the other side, is that really being fit? So I want you to think about how fitness and exercise pertains to your day-to-day, -to, -day, to your quality of life, to doing your job. It's not just well, I want to look good. I want my arms to look better. I want to lose weight so I look good in my dress for the wedding. It means, can I pick up my bag of groceries without throwing my back out? Can I reach overhead on that board without getting impingement pain in my shoulder? So encouraging people to take a second look at their fitness routine, as it were, and think about, and I hate to use the hot word, but the literal definition is what resonates with me, is functional fitness. Like, it's great to look good. 
but I've seen lots of guys who could look good who literally couldn't put a belt on their own jeans because their arms were stuck like this. That's not functionally fit. <laughs> Next slide. So as I alluded to earlier, working out for the sake of being healthy is what it means to actually be fit. And there are many facets that all pertain to our day-to-day -day life. Strength, stamina, endurance, coordination, balance, power, speed, accuracy, agility, all of these things in some way, shape, or form. They may not be on your true day-to-day, -day, but life will throw you curveballs. When that friend calls you and says, hey, I need you to help me move my couch, suddenly being able to deadlift 100 or 2 pounds is really handy. Or if, God forbid, someone's dog gets loose and chases you, and you have to run away from them and hop over a fence. Suddenly, explosive power and being able to jump in coordination is really important so you don't lose your Achilles tendon. Right? Like you just never know when these things will happen. Next slide. So, now the reason you guys are here, you've got your own issues to deal with. This is Pat Penatar, by the way, singing uh, Hit Me With Your Best Shot. Questions and things that I can help demonstrate. Of course, I realize I haven't demonstrated how to use a foam roller or a lacrosse ball yet, but I know you guys are here because you probably have some nagging issues of I'm not going to go over every single little thing in the body. We need more than an hour and a half but how we can apply all the things that we learned today to everything that you could possibly come across. Go for it. Jim Renata. Okay, I'll go. <laughs> so uh, thank you. This, is, this has been very, very helpful. Good. Uh, so my, my main question is, uh, you know, when I'm I, so working on this, in my home studio and mm -hmm. I have a stand up desk, I have a computer desk and I feel like I get enough variety. And, you know, the main problem is when as we're starting to go back to working live and standing at a wall mm -hmm. for eight hours. Right. Drawing, crouching, uh, running around. And <laughs> we don't get to take breaks when we want to. Mm. So I'd be interested in some sort of a if there's a simple if there's a simple stretch or exercise that you could do for you know five ten seconds without looking like a complete idiot because you're we're we're also in front of a room full of people so sure sure um, you know just something that that could you know a quick rejuvenation re-energizing stretch motion so i would say you know obviously you're what you're asking for is the motion is lotion i want to stretch to make sure things aren't getting stiff i'm getting good circulation right right um the second component to that what i think of is hydration of are you able you said not taking breaks like do you have fluid on hand and my wife even joked and she said you could do a camel bath <laughs> like if you can't even stop to you know grab a mug all right i'm good <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, it honestly, it depends um, on your level of fitness. Like I could give you something that could hit everything in like five seconds, but that may not be doable for everyone. Mm. Um, yeah. Like usually like an inversion, like a forward fold gives you good hamstring stretch. It gets blood up to your body. The top part is above your heart. And especially if your arms are over your head, that blood is difficult to get down. So when you go inverted, like a, just a, a quick toe touch, all of a sudden that everything was above is now below. So all that blood is rushing to your upper extremities. And okay. then everything that was in your lower quarter is now getting a really good stretch, particularly hamstrings. If you have been sitting during COVID for a long time, those poor hammies are probably nice and glued and matted down. Um, you know, obviously you can't roll on the spot and it depends, you know, person to person. Like if I'm a little bit taller, my shoulders might not be you know, as challenged as if I'm five foot six. Mm, mm -hmm. So I hate to, I hate to say it depends, but if you have a specific like body part issue, that's like your kind of, you know, your, your main bad guy that you're battling with, you know, let me know and I'll throw some at you. Yeah. Well, it's, it's always my lower back. That's okay. That's, that's the first thing that, <laughs> that I feel. And, Sorry, I, and yeah, I can, you know, that's sort of a quick, you know, bend over, touch your toes. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I do that. It seems to, you know, help with stretching things out and, 
Um, I'm still, I'm still feeling it yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah, and and I would I would also have you recall the battle of attrition where you may not have that luxury of being able to just stretch on the moment and get it to go away, but those eight hours will slowly accrue over time. There are things that you can do on either end of that before and after, so mm -hmm. that way your next episode doesn't bother you at all. And that's where I would recommend the lacrosse ball of if your muscles are already tight going into that meeting, when you're having to stand and really use them when you're moving around, it's not going to take much before your muscles are angry. So if you do a good pre massage and get them loose going into that meeting, you could probably go another two to three hours before they start to get angry. And hopefully by then you're almost done. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I would think about that and a lot of what am I doing while I'm not at work again, making fitness your new hobby to undo things faster than you're racking it up because you can't not be on your feet. Right. 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 Okay. So, okay. Yeah. It's never the solution we want to hear, but they're usually pretty yeah. good. Solutions. <laughs> it's like, no, the stretch isn't what's going to help you. It's the rolling. that's probably going to help. <laughs> well, so you say that, I mean, the, the lacrosse ball, it sounds very portable yeah. as opposed to a big foam roller. So yeah. is it actually, you put the, you put the ball on the floor and you just kind of roll on top of it or. So I have my handy dandy tripod that I've been doing my uh, video on. So I will actually get on the floor and demonstrate for you. This is why I wanted to have it as an hour and a half, but my slide went to 20 minutes because I figured people would have a lot of specifics that they would want to see. There we go. So, there we go. Wax out of the way. So, as we mentioned, never rolling on bones. Bones are bad. So, I'm never going to place this right on my spine. That's okay. a no no. Foam roller and upper back is a little different because you have ribs, but low back, I'm going to pick one side. So, I'm going to go, we'll say just to the left so you can see. Low back's a little different. I'm going to start lying down, bridge place ball and then very gently allow my hips to lower back down so the weight of my hips is pulling my body into my back so i am literally lying here and i'm using my feet to help support my hips so that's probably the only amount of work is kind of levitating my hips slightly i came here for the i'll get you in a second right your thing was cut off so now the more I relax holding my hips up, the more my hips are dropping and the more pressure and the deeper this ball is sinking. And if your low back is not happy with you, this will not feel like rainbows and sunshine. So find that spot that's slightly uncomfortable that you can tolerate and then mentally get that low back to let go. It's one of those things that people can't really engage consciously. So it's also difficult for them to shut off consciously. And once you feel a change in pain, it should diminish. It's like a dimmer switch. It's not going to go from on to off. It's going to go from like 90% to maybe 80, 75%. You've done good. Move that ball to a different spot and repeat. Do this when you wake up. Do this before your presentation and then do it after and do it before you go to bed. Bet you within a week, you're going to feel like a new man. It may not be gone, but it should feel noticeably better that you're like, holy crap, this actually works. You do that for a month and it will probably damn near be gone. And you just, there's no movement. There's no rolling back and forth. There's no. Only to find a new spot. Okay. Because it's never just in like, it's not like a little pinprick, right, right? right? It's a big muscle. So you have to get all of the muscle units. But over time, you're going to be kind of giving them all attention. So they're going to all be starting to release. And then that goes into the, the fitness component of, okay, we've gotten them to let go, but is this also a consequence of my low back being weak? Or I could get that thing to, to zero, but if my muscles are not very strong, they'll start to get very upset with me if I'm, on, if I'm standing for an hour or two. And again, another consequence of COVID and being stuck in our chairs, we lost a lot of our strength being sedentary. So suddenly we just expect to hop back up and be active again when we're about two years weaker, right? Mm -hmm. so this is where again going into the gym focusing on things like deadlifts which is a great low back exercise good mornings back extensions 
other things to help build that low back strength. Mm-hmm. Motion is lotion. But then again, if the back's already angry, you need to then use the lacrosse ball after your training sessions to make sure that you're not piling on your low back working, doing a big project or a, a big presentation, wearing your low back out and then going to the gym and doing more back. It's not going to help. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. So using this to help undo the punishment is clutch. Okay. And I saw Brian had a message, Brian, I, I'm sorry, I missed it. It was, it was just an appreciation. I was saying, I came here for this, you know, when you started doing the demonstration, um, I, I will, you know, I'll tell you, I have a, I have a slightly different problem that, that I had. So I, I typically travel with these, these big portable walls, right. And uh, I am always throwing my back out, you know, trying to load these things in. Cause I gotta, I gotta lift them up, you know, like that. And I gotta slide them sideways into my car. Um, mm-hmm. So is there, is there anything that I can do? And it's, it's right, right here in my, my spinal extensor. So I've been trying to do like deadlifts and things to try to make it a little bit stronger. Is there anything else I can do other than finding a better way to manhandle this thing into my car? Um, Cause if I ever pinch something, it's doing it. It's it, that's the move. Were, were you taught how to brace? How to bounce so, Uh No, why don't you show me? <laughs> well, I can show you, but you won't see anything. That's it. So the Valsalva maneuver in medical terminology is literally what you do when you poop. <laughs> everyone knows it because everyone poops. Hold so everyone up, knows back you up for a second. About. You want me to do what while I'm loading my I want car? you to crap your pants. No, no, no I'm just kidding. <laughs> so it's, it's the same motion with a slight caveat, all right? So in the medical terminology, the Valsalva maneuver is increasing what we call intrathecal pressure or the pressure inside of your thorax. So all the things that are in there try to escape. And what usually happens is just the poop that escapes. But we obviously don't need you pooping your pants every time you lift something. So what you're going to do is then try to not take a poop. So you're doing both simultaneously. So what ends up happening is you are, I I know it's graphic, but everyone understands the language because everybody does it. You're going to pucker up and then try to push. But because it can't go anywhere, the pressure remains. And what ends up happening is if my abdomen is soft and I'm lifting something, my spine can move like I can flex. But if I brace, I have no choice but to stay stock still. So in, in lifting terminology, we call this bracing. And this is what actually happens when people use weightlifting belts, which is, again, a huge, huge misnomer or misunderstanding for the non-initiated. Weightlifting belts are not meant to hold you in position. Weightlifting belts are for you to push against. And the exercise that I do to help show people that is I want you to, you know, like flex your bicep as hard as you can sure okay then i usually have someone come up and try to pull your arm out and say don't let me move you and they go like which was harder flexing against yourself or flexing against something else oh of course flexing against something else that's what you're doing with the belt so if i just say brace whatever (laughs) but if i say push against that belt as hard as you can actually grab here so what ends up happening is when people wear their weightlifting belts, and if you're having to do this constantly, you might as well just invest in one as a friendly reminder. We also call this a kinesthetic feedback, is I put the belt on, but then if you were standing here, my microphone were closer, when I brace, you can actually hear the Velcro kind of stretch and pull a little bit from where I am flexing against it and taking up more space. And I can feel myself like I can feel this pressure where I'm leaning into the belt essentially. And so when I'm lifting and I feel that pressure diminish, that means I'm losing my brace. So it's a reminder to myself to squeeze harder. You know, when you're lifting and your muscles kind of feel like they're failing because they're tired, I can feel that pressure diminish. So it's a reminder for me to try harder so that I don't lose that brace. So I don't hurt my back. So for you, I would say like, it's just a mechanics problem rather than a strength problem or a rolling problem. So, all right. See so, you, Jim. Bye-bye. Thank you. What I heard was, uh, 
push and pucker, Maybe. which has got to be the best advice I've ever received in my life. That's amazing. Pucker and then push under no circumstances. Oh, the other way push. around. Got it. Okay. <laughs> it's like pirates. Pillage and burn under no circumstance do you burn first. Right. <laughs> That's a good metaphor to remind us. Um, and yeah. thank you so much. That was so helpful. Everything good. you shared with us. Um, I have a question for you. Do you have something that we can do um, maybe with the lacrosse ball? I, I don't know. Um, for tennis elbow? Mm. 100%. The only, the only time you are limited with these tools is with your imagination. Okay. So with tennis elbow, and I, I don't, you might have to do a little bit of digging, but to the uninitiated of, you know, if you don't know muscles and anatomy, you just kind of have to dig around a little bit via the internet of like tennis elbow. What is tennis elbow? And they will say, oh, well, it's, you know, when these muscles are blah, 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 it's too tight. It'll show you pictures of your elbow and say the tendons that cross over. Now I get tennis and golfer's elbow mixed up. So remind me, is tennis the one on the inside or the outside? The outside. Outside. Okay, good. So I'll turn it this way then. So tennis elbow is the muscles and tendons that cross over the elbow right here. And when they get so tight, whenever your elbow bends, they snap over the joint. And that constant snapping and rubbing creates tendonitis. Yeah. Problem solved. So then logic would di dictate, well, if my muscles weren't so tight, then the tendons wouldn't be tight and they'd be nice and slack and they wouldn't snap over my elbow, right? So in tennis elbow, the tendons that go right here are actually part of your forearm extensors. And those extensors control your fingers. Mm -hmm. So if you actually put your hand on your forearm and you wiggle your fingers, you can feel them flex and do their thing. So all you're going to do is take your lacrosse ball. Find you a flat surface. I came prepared today. And you're just going to position yourself on that ball. And again, you are in control of how much pressure you can apply. It should not feel like rainbows and sunshine, but it doesn't need to be screaming bloody murder. And then from there, I can just gradually roll around. And if it doesn't feel good and you know you're not on bone or artery or nerve, then you're probably in the right spot. From there, you can do other little fun things. I like to call it flossing, where as I find a spot that feels particularly gnarly, I can wiggle those fingers so now on the inside, my muscle fibers are sliding across the ball and being challenged to help maybe break up any adhesions, but also promote circulation. That motion is lotion. And then, oh, yeah, there's a spot right there. That's good. Even wrist circles to get that to go. And then finally contract, relax. So I can even just like make a fist and kind of flex against the ball. And then as I relax, let that ball sink in. And then just try to use my mind's eye. and Just relax. It's okay. Do that for about five, 10 minutes, right. and it should hurt less. You don't have to go to 100%, but as long as it's noticeably different, you've done good. The other beauty to SMR is that you can't really overdo it. Right. So one of the few instances where more is better. So if you have something that's gotten to the point where it it has a clinical diagnosis of like not docs that I have tennis elbow, it's pretty bad then you probably need to be doing this a lot and it just becomes your new baby and usually within a week it's like whoa this is better than advil type deal okay so thank you yeah. that was terrific of, yeah of course yeah it's, it's literally that simple i can't charge people for this it's, it's a terrible marketing uh, <laughs> strategy but <laughs> it's it is very much a you know feed a man a fish Feed them for a day, teach a man to fish, feed them for life, right? So. Well, actually, Andrew, to that point, what is the best way to keep in touch with you if we've got follow-on yes. questions? Yeah, if we want to keep in touch? Yeah, you can just email me. It's andrew.pafford at gmail.com. And obviously, my, uh, my, my real kind of moment to shine is the actual exercise component. Everything that we discussed today and foam rolling and soft tissue work is very much like the first five, maybe 10 minutes of a session that I would typically have my clients do. And for those that have been with me a while, they do it ahead of time so that we can actually have an hour where we're doing the fun stuff. You, you know, it's, it's very simple and rudimentary. You don't need me standing over you, you know, getting inappropriate with a ball for 10 minutes, right? Like <laughs> it's, it's just, yeah, it's, it's sort of a waste of both of our times. So I show my clients in the beginning how to really go after their own aches and pains and nagging demons. And then they just do it themselves and they usually just resolve on their own. 
if they can be resolved through that. Otherwise, the exercise component comes in and then we cover all the angles. That's great. Well, Andrew, yeah. thank you for your time. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now. Awesome. Thank you. Big Nova Scribes, thank you. All right. Yeah.